Good evening, everyone. My name is Denis Storyorov, and I'm happy to welcome you tonight. I'm an assistant curator um, at Pushkin House, and we are going to spend the evening tonight with two wonderful scholars. One, um, the first who is going to moderate the evening is Rachel Polonsky, who, who is um, uh, who is a uh, vice president and fellow in Slavonic studies at Murray Edwards College in Cambridge. She is a specialist in 19th and 20th century poetry, fiction, and memoir, and she's particularly interested in those contexts in which Russian literature originated and is being perceived. She is the author of Molotov's Magic Lantern, an intellectual and subjective journey, inspired by Vyacheslav Molotov's personal library. And of course, she is in conversation today with Douglas Smith, who is a translator and historian and the author of six books about Russia. Douglas has taught and lectured widely in the United States, Britain, and Europe, and has appeared in documentaries for National Geographic, the BBC, and Netflix. His book, Former People, The Final Days of the Russian Aristocracy, is a bestseller in the UK, and it won the inaugural Pushkin House Book Prize in 2013. And today, we are obviously discussing his new translation of Konstantin Postovsky's Magnum Opus, The Story of a Life. So thank you, Rachel and Douglas. Well, I shall begin. Um, this is a terrible time. This is a terrible moment in history. And it's a time of grief and agony and unbearable anxiety. And I'm remembering the first time I met Douglas many years ago in a different time in Moscow when he was working on his wonderful book, uh, Former People, about the uh, Russian aristocracy which then went, went on to win the first Pushkin House book prize. And uh, today I was just looking back through his now newly produced wonderful <laughs> translation of Pastovsky's Story of a Life. And I found this paragraph, which seemed particularly resonant, describing Moscow as it was then in um, the first days of the First World War said Russia itself was on the move. The entire country had been turned into an armed camp. Life became unrecognizable. Everything we had held as familiar and permanent had vanished in an instant. And that's what the people of Ukraine are facing today. So it's in the spirit of solidarity uh, with the people of Ukraine that we're going to discuss Pastovsky's book tonight, which is set in this in this terrain across Kiev, Moscow, Odessa, places that are now engaged in this horrifying conflict. So first of all, Douglas, can I ask you what made you undertake this translation? Oh, good question. Um, I just want to reiterate what people have said. This is a really horrible, horrible moment. And, you know, I can contemplated canceling this event, wondering why we should be doing this. And the more I thought about it, um, thinking about Paustovsky and thinking about his work, I mean, if there's a voice that needs to be heard now, it's 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 his, um, for reason I hope that we'll explore a bit tonight during the conversation. Um, and I, we're all devastated and we're all shattered. We all probably have friends and family that are in Ukraine and Russia now. and. Um, our thoughts are, are are with them at this at this dark, horrible moment. Um, I came to this book and the idea of a translation through all sorts of strange circumstances, none of them planned, um, uh, just random coincidence. Um, I I went off to study German, not to go too far back, uh, maybe forty years. <laughs> Uh, in 1981, after finishing high school uh, in Minnesota, and I, I went to a university where it was the Department of German and Russian, and I knew I was going to do German as a major, and one of my advisors suggested I try Russian that first year there, and I had no interest in Russia, I had, knew nothing about the country, um, and um, said, just kind of on a whim, I said, sure, I'll try it, and from the very first days of my Russian language class, I sort of fell in love with the language and was fascinated by the country and culture. 
And I just happened to be in a bookstore uh, there by the university and, and, and saw this book, The Story of a Life in paperback on a table. And I never heard of the, the author, didn't know anything about the book. I'd really never read any Russian literature, but I bought the book on a whim and I, I gave it a try. And I was just immediately um, captivated by it and swept up by it. And it, it just completely entranced me. Um, and I used to then give my copy of the book to everybody I knew, pressing it on them that they had to read this amazing book. And many years went by, studied Russia, spent a lot of time there working, studying. Um, and then it was in 2015, I was in Moscow and I was walking through Kuzminki Park. Um, and I noticed a building off to the side of one of the main alleys there. And I went over to check it out. And to my surprise, it was a museum dedicated to Paustovsky. Uh, and I hadn't thought about him in a while. And I, I went inside and was sort of taken back to when I was 18 and I'd first discovered him. And um, I bought a copy of, of Story of a Life in Russian now uh, and read it again. And I was filled with that same feeling of wonder and amazement that I'd had before, although I would say much richer, um, more complex now, given my greater knowledge of the history and culture and language of the place. And I decided to, to see if, if the book was still in print in English and um, soon learned that it was out of print. Um, and so I, I found with the aid of my agent uh, who owned the English rights to, to Paustovsky's works and was gonna reissue the, the English translation. But I started comparing the English translation to the Russian original and sort of quickly convinced myself that uh, the original translation could be improved upon. Um, and so I set about to, to, to translate it myself, not realizing just how long uh, it was going to take me. And so that's sort of a very long winded answer to how it is that I, I came to, to spend uh, the time doing this work. So it's the story of a life and, and the, 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 the parts of that life that you've given us in this translation, it's, it's the first three parts of a, a six part work that was completed obviously over many years but but this part of the life uh was spent between what's ukraine now and moscow and odessa as i've said tell us tell us about pastovsky and, and and what kind of a person he was and what his relationship was with with ukraine right so pastovsky was born uh in 1892 in moscow uh, in Granatny Pereulok, for people who know the, the, the city. Um, but then as a very young boy, moved with his family, his mother and father, his two brothers and sister to Kiev. And Kiev was really his childhood home. That's where he grew up. That's where he went to school. Uh, he went to the elite uh, gymnasium there. Um, one of his fellow um, pupils at the time was uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, who he, he knew from school there. Um, he came from like so many people in that part of the world, he, he came from various backgrounds. On, on his father's side, he was um, a descendant of uh, Zaporozhian Cossacks. Um, so he had Ukrainian family background. On his mother's side, they were Russian. He had a Polish grandmother. He had a Turkish grandmother. So he was very much a product of empire, um, a product of, of various different places that he always acknowledged and was always sort of very proud of. Um, he grew up in, in Kiev, as I said, his family life was destroyed when he was young, when his father left the family for another woman, um, ruined the family financially, um, and had a devastating emotional impact on, on young uh, Konstantin um, Paustovsky, who then had to go off and live with an, an aunt and uncle for a while. Um, and then at a very young age, pretty much had to take care of himself. He was able to continue schooling by tutoring. Um, and then he ended up uh, back in Moscow and was studying there when World War I broke out. His two brothers went off to serve. He got a job uh, given his bad eyesight and the fact his brothers were off at the war working on a tram in Moscow, which he describes in great detail um, in, in one of the chapters of the book. And then later got a job as an orderly on a hospital train and experienced firsthand just some of the most uh, horrific aspects of, of fighting and combat. And, the, and then later went on to have a series of odd jobs throughout Russia. He was like a rolling stone. He was always in a new town, in a new city, um, doing all sorts of work um, as a proofer at newspapers, as a sort of cub reporter. He worked in factories. He worked in fishing and everything. 
it was only really after the the end of the Civil War that he became a full time writer and acquired a definite uh, amount of fame and recognition uh, by the 1930s, although he was always sort of outside the mainstream currents of Russian, Russian literature, I would say, um, not someone who wrote um, themes that uh, were widely sort of embraced by most of literary um, Soviet Union, if you will, at the time. And it's only really in his later years in the 1960s uh, with the publication of the various volumes that, that form Story of a Life that his real fame uh, came to him, especially when these were translated um, in various world languages. And he was hugely popular um, at the time of his death in, in 1968. Um, he was uh, put up for the Nobel Prize in literature several times and everyone thought he was gonna win in 1965. Um, but he, uh, smart man that he was, knew that there was no way the Soviet Union would allow that to happen. He was, he was never a dissident, but he was, he was, he was sort of a, you know, unorthodox writer and figure sort of at, at a distance from official culture. And after the scandal surrounding Pasternak's victory in 58, the Soviet Union leaned hard on the Swedish Academy and said, you are not giving Palstovsky the Nobel Prize. And they buckled and gave it to Sholokhov instead. Um, but uh, to give you an idea of just, I think the, the great admiration that people held him in at the time, which is largely forgotten now, um, and the fame and so even celebrity that he enjoyed, I wanted to try to share my screen. Uh, there's a famous photograph. And again, I'll apologize right now. I'm, I'm a historian translator. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, allergic to technology, but I'm going to try this. Uh, this is a pretty well-known photograph. Maybe some of you have seen it, uh, but one of Postovsky's greatest fans was uh, the actress, uh, Hollywood icon, Marlene Dietrich who had read one of his novellas called Telegram in a French translation and then, and then read um, Story of a Life in French translation. And she was on a tour of the Soviet Union in 1964. And when she arrived there in Moscow, she was asked by journalists who was the one person in Russia that she absolutely had to meet. And she said, Konstantin Paustovsky. So after one of her performances there uh, in June of 64, um, uh, she was told to remain on stage for a few moments and slowly up came this uh, this gentleman in a dark suit who was helped up onto the stage. Postovsky had just had a heart attack, but was brought from the hospital with his doctor um, and brought up on stage uh, to be introduced to Dietrich, who was so overwhelmed to be uh, in front of her idol that she fell to her knees uh, as a sign of uh, you know utter respect for him and his gifts. Um, and poor Paustovsky was standing there and he wanted to lift her back up, uh, the gentleman that he was, but his doctors were yelling at him from off stage, don't you dare, don't you dare try to lift her or you'll be back in the hospital with another heart attack. So she sort of <laughs> had to sort of stand in this, uh, kneel in this awkward position uh, until help came and uh, lifted her up. But I, I like the photograph because it shows just how incredibly popular he was at the time. This is just four years before his death. Um, and he was really uh, feted and, and celebrated around the world at the time. So Douglas, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to read from your translation, but before you do that, can you talk to us a bit about Pastovsky's writing and why he's such a special writer and so dear to you? That's a good question. You know, it's, Palsovsky, like a lot of writers, is not read uh, as much as he was um, in his lifetime. Um, I've, I've called the introduction that I wrote for the book sort of, you know, the life and work of, of a forgotten master. And in many ways, he is forgotten. Um, he was long taught in schools in, in Russia and the Soviet Union. And I sometimes wonder if being taught to young children actually can turn people off from certain authors because it, it feels like they're being forced to eat their vegetables or, or something like that. Um, but what attracted the writing, what attracted me to the writing was the, the directness of his um, expression, the concrete nature of his language. It's um, deceptively simple language. It's not, there's nothing pyrotechnical here. This is not a Nabokov who's uh, showing off his incredible uh, linguistic literary gifts. It's more as if you're sitting quietly uh, in a living room or home of somebody and they are just literally recounting stories. Um, but it's, 
I say it's deceptively simple because I, I worked with uh, Polstovsky's manuscripts uh, that are in a major archive in Moscow when I was working on the translation. And to see the, the amount of revision that went into his work is remarkable. To get that sort of direct, simple um, form of expression that he has was incredibly difficult work. And that was one of the things that I found hard translating was to not be wordy myself, to, to, to try to express what he says with as few words as, as, as possible while still capturing um, all of the expressiveness. So that's the one thing. Also, I think um, for me, I, maybe this is age or something speaking. Uh, maybe when I was younger, uh, you know, I was more impressed by what Nabokov could do with, with, with the language. Um, as I've gotten older, I feel there's sometimes a, there's a, a lack of a beating heart in, in some of those writings. There's a real human quality about Postovsky. There's a real tenderness. He belongs to the romantic tradition of a Bunin or somebody like that. Um, and to me, increasingly, I find that particularly powerful and, and, and important, not just um, the way someone says something, but also the, the, the spirit that uh, kind of lies behind it. And I think it's a very humane book. It's a very um, rich, um, emotionally generous um, uh, work, I would say. I think a reviewer for this last translation for The Spectator there in the UK called it probably the most life-affirming book that you'll, you'll see published this year. And I think that's a good way of putting it. Well, that is exactly right. And I have to say in the past week or so with switching between reading horror on my devices and, and, and going back to your translation, the, which is also set during war and upheaval and chaos and violence, the extraordinary ability to capture silence and beauty and the lyricism of landscape and the connections between human beings that, that inevitably happen uh, even, in, even in such um, times has been tremendously consoling to the spirit and uh, you you have talked about Paustovsky as an anti-war writer I think Doug and can you say a few words about that and then and then I know you've got a couple of passages that you'd like to read to us but I was just interested before you do that in 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 how you feel he writes about war but with a particular kind of human perspective on it yeah, so it's interesting. Um, Postovsky, as he writes over and over, was a dreamer, um, a romantic. Um, his family used to tease him mercilessly that he lived in a dream world, that he he was not part of the real world. And he, I think for a long time, viewed that as a character flaw of his, um, but eventually sort of made peace with that. He was attacked by some writers uh, as as failing to look honestly at the world, that he looked at it with rose-colored glasses. Shalama, for example, um, was quite quite harsh about things that Postovsky wrote. And I, I discuss it in my introduction, I feel somewhat unfairly, because one of the things that I came away with the more time I spent with this book is if you read carefully, um, he's obviously very much anti-war, regardless who is engaging in the war, um, but just war, in and of itself, regardless whatever cause may one want to attach to it. He speaks about eloquently and he condemns repeatedly. Um, not only that, but one of the things, and I, I don't know if we'll get into it today, but a careful reading shows that he fully embraced the February Revolution of 1917 and the downfall of the Romanov autocracy. But what's particularly interesting is how he writes about the November Bolshevik seizure of power. There's nothing glorious, there's nothing heroic. And in fact, and you know, he writes openly, I did not decide to go and stay with the people's decision until after the civil war, until basically the end of 1920. So he says quite openly, I was never, you know, a Bolshevik supporter. And he's writing this stuff in the uh, you know, 40s and 50s. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. So let me just read. Um, I don't know, do I do I start with do I start with war or do I start with something uh, a bit uh, more, <laughs> less, less horrifying? Let me start with this section here. This is when he was working as an orderly 
on a hospital train in World War I. It's from a chapter called Beyond the Muddy Sand. And he's in Galicia, which is Galicia, which is now a part of modern day Poland. Uh, this is 368. Wagons filled with refugees trotted past, past our train, heading north to cross the sand. Ragged groups of worn out inf infantrymen straggled by. The ground shook and rolled. The glass in the carriage windows rattled. The train eventually stopped in a large clearing. Yellowish clouds of shrapnel exploded here and there on the surrounding leafy slopes. The cavalry gallop passed. A field battery concealed in some nearby undergrowth fired with deafening intensity. Dr. Pokrovsky ordered us to raise two Red Cross flags on top of the train. We were moved forward a little towards a bombed out crossing keeper's hut. Beside it on the dirty grass lay dozens of injured men in makeshift bandages. We immediately began loading the wounded onto the train. Soon the carriages were full, but the wounded kept coming. We laid them down in the corridors, in the vestibules, in the staff room. Their low painful groans echoed throughout the entire train. The fighting was getting closer, but we couldn't see it. All I noticed was a shattered window on the train and the occasional piercing ring of bullets bouncing off the rails. One of our orderlies was wounded in the shoulder. Ramanin was knocked on the ground by a heavy blast. We barely noticed any of this since we were all so consumed by one thought, namely getting the wounded aboard as fast as possible. A sweaty officer rode up to the train and shouted for Pokrovsky. His epilepsy were so covered in dust that you couldn't even tell his rank. Hurry up, he yelled, straining to be heard over the noise. Get this bloody train out of here. In 15 minutes, it'll be too late. You've got to get a double load going. Now get moving. Shaking a whip in his hand, the officer pointed to the north while his, horses, while his horse spun in circles as if possessed. We can take more wounded up on the roof, Pokrovsky shouted back. Load them on as you're heading out, he yelled. And then he jerked his horse and galloped towards the engine. Just then the train moved. A few more wounded managed to grab hold of the handrails and the orderlies pulled them onto the platforms. Only now did I notice it was getting dark. The flashing explosions had become clear and the dust cloud on the horizon had turned an ominous crimson color. For several minutes, we could hear the sound of bullets ricocheting off the train. Soon we were going very fast. Once we finally slowed down, we realized that we had barely escaped from the pocket. The train was carrying several hundred wounded men, their field dressings soaked with blood and falling off, their faces darkened by thirst. All the bandages had to be changed. We had to find the most seriously wounded among them who required immediate surgery. We set to work at once, and from that moment on, time stood still. We had ceased to notice it. After every 15 minutes, I swabbed the blood off the linoleum floor of the operating room, threw away the crusted bandages, and was then called to the oper operating table, where, not fully realizing what I was doing, I held a wounded man's leg, trying not to look, as Pokrovsky cut through the sugar-white bone with his hard steel saw. In an instant, the leg became very heavy in my hand, and I became dimly aware through the fog in my head that the operation was over. And then I carried the severed leg to a zinc chest to be buried later at the next stop. Thank you. So, so that's a, that's a harsh um, passage, and 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 Hostovsky himself talks about the evolution of his own writing in the process of you know these events these these epic events that are taking place around him and in which he's swept up later later in the book um he's in kiev when it's under siege by simon bitlura the ukrainian um nationalist leader during the civil war and he says that paradoxically being in a city under siege a long siege was enabling for his writing. It gave, a, it, he said that as the noose of the siege tightened around the city, his own writing tightened up and it gave a kind of clear focus for him as, as a writer, uh, which I found, which I found interesting. And, and he's, 
he's he has this ability to write very softly about beauty and, and nature, but also um, and in the spirit of this anti-war writing that you, you find um, incredible hardness about people who are violent and stupid and cruel and fanatical, um, which again is, is highly resonant over a hundred years later. Yeah, so I would just say, and that's, you know, thinking about what's going on right now. Um, and, you know, like a lot of people here, I'm sure having friends that are in Kiev right now, uh, it reminded me of exactly that moment that you you talk about. He was trying to get to his sister um, and his mother who were in the Ukrainian countryside during the Civil War, and he makes it to Kiev, barely. Um, and then he gets caught there uh, and um, is, is unable to get out of Kiev and is, in fact, uh, then sort of forced to go into the army of Pavlov Skaropadsky one of the, you know, temporary uh, German backed leaders. And he describes the absurdity of the situation of being in this, in this uh, army. Uh, and then later he's forced into a convict battalion uh, in the red army. And he describes just the insane brutality and, and insanity um, of the leader of this uh, red battalion, which is again, interesting in that he's, you know, writing this um, uh, at a time where denouncing, you know, the red actions in the Civil War is obviously a tricky thing to do. But again, throughout it, he describes the absurdity of the war and the absurdity of, of, of violence like this. Um, and then you're exactly right, is, is that he writes about how because of the siege, no information was getting in or out of, of Kiev when he's there. And so there's this certain quiet that allows him to write exactly as you say, which obviously is so different from the situation today, given the technology we have, um, the, the, the ability to see uh, videos of, of what's happening in live time and everything. It's such a different, uh, a different experience of, 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 of a very similar um, brutality. So there's that wonderful picture you've shown us of Marlene Dietrich at his feet. Um, and of that obviously is a high point of his reputation. What, what's, what, uh, what's his reputation now, as far as you understand it in, in Russia? Uh, it's a good question. When I, <laughs> to, uh, I, I, I went to Russia a few times um, to work with his manuscripts in the archives. I wanted to, to go to Tarusa where he lived his later years, um, where he's buried. And I met with his um, stepdaughter, uh, Galina Arbuzova, who's still alive and very vibrant uh, woman. And she gave me a tour and told me personal anecdotes about Postovsky, her, her stepfather and things like that. Um, you know, he, I, well, I suppose on one hand, maybe people would disagree with me. Obviously literature just doesn't hold that place in society in Russia that it did obviously in the Soviet period. Um, like everywhere, maybe literature has been pushed out by other forms of entertainment and ways of di distract yourselves. Um, there's that element. I think uh, to a lot of uh, you know younger Russians, he's a, a, a vague figure with thick glasses and a heavy coat uh, that they know a bit about. Um, I think more sort of the older generation uh, still remember him and and remember him fondly uh, in that in that sort of thing, but. Um, I had this one image I wanted to show again, sort of like the way things have, have changed, I think, in, in Russia. I'm going to try to share my screen again here. So um, Postovsky was buried not far from the little house that he, he had in, in Tarusa, overlooking a, 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 a hillside with a little stream down below it. Um, and in fact, it's interesting, he has a, he had a writer's shed uh, outside the house. The house where he lived was incredibly modest, nothing fancy, nothing grand. Um, but he had this little wooden writer's shed that looked out sort of in the same direction that this photograph is, is, is aiming. Um, and he would write there until word got out that, that, that there was this writing shed and people on the other side of this little stream would gather to try to watch him write. And it became, became so distracting that he had to plant a row of trees to sort of shield himself from curious uh, onlookers and everything. Um, but it's not far from there that, that he's buried. 
And I was kind of surprised when I went to visit his grave site um, to see this enormous metal Orthodox cross. Um, and it, it seemed out of place to me, as well as these horrific plastic flowers that people have laid there. Um, because he was not in any way a religious man. And he writes about religion in, in his memoir. Um, and he really has no time for religion, to be quite honest, whatever. I mean, he understands its, its attraction to people, but he, he never really considered himself an Orthodox believer, um, never attended church and, or anything like that. Um, and his original gravesite was just this stone that you see in the foreground. But, but, this massive cross has has been added as if to suggest that Postovsky was some great champion of the Orthodox faith and that it defined him and his life and his writings. And thinking about it, it, it showed me in very vivid detail sort of how the intellectual climate has changed in Russia in recent decades. This sort of uh, jingoism, um, extreme nationalism that has come to the fore and, and completely distorted uh, so much of Russia's past. And we see that sadly in many spheres of, of, of Russian life today. And in fact, it reminds me, I just wanted to read just a, a little passage about that, that Postovsky writes. This is from uh, volume three in a chapter called The Violet Ray. Every nation has its own character, its own distinguishing traits, but the chauvinists who drool over them, who lose all sense of proportion in their fanatical worship, turn themselves and these traits into something pathetic and at times even disgusting. That is why jingoists are a nation's greatest enemies. Um, and I think that's a sentiment that sadly we, we see all too often now and and probably in more countries than we, we care to even admit. So this was the first um, Russian writer that you read. This was, I, this was I, I'm embarrassed to say that because, you know, as someone who's been dedicated well over half my life to Russia and, and all that, and, you know, people, uh, they say, oh, you're a Russian historian. You know, I'm, I'm sure you read Chekhov as a child and, and Dostoevsky, and you know, you were so sweet. I said, no, actually, I was a hooligan as a teenager. I actually, I was into more sort of making projectiles and 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 things that exploded. Um, uh, things I don't tell my children about just yet. Um, but no, I went off to college. Like I said, I didn't know anything about Russia, and I had no interest in Russia. I knew I wanted to study German, and I continued to study German. Uh, lived in Germany, lived in Vienna, and places. Um, but it was Paulstovsky, yeah, that really sort of captured me. And so um, it seems kind of odd, but uh, that's that was my path to Russia. So is it the first Russian writer you've translated? Uh, no, not exactly. I did a book years ago. Um, uh, I wanted to write a, at one point, a, a biography of Prince Potemkin, Potemkin. Um, and I was starting to do that and learned about Simon Sebag Montefiore there uh, in London, who was a year or two ahead of me and, and we became friends and everything. And I said, okay, I'm not gonna do that. He'll do a, a great job and I'm not gonna waste time. But in my research for that, I read the um, personal correspondence between Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin, which is an, amazing. It's over a thousand letters. And it's an, the, the, the correspondence sort of tells this dual biography of these two most remarkable uh, figures of, of Russian, indeed, world history. And so uh, not wanting to leave uh, Potemkin completely behind, I ended up doing an edited translation of, of their letters um, that was incredibly fun to work on, incredibly challenging, trying to render uh, that 18th century Russian into some sort of readable uh, English that didn't sound too modern or sound like it was trying to uh, completely speak uh, in the, the sounds of, of, of what the 18th century might've been like. So I did that a long time ago. So then in some ways that prepared me, I, I suppose, for doing this book. And, what, and what's, what's your process when you, when you translate? How, how do you do the work? How do you approach it? Well, 
You know, one thing that I knew I wanted to be careful of when I took on this uh, this translation was, um, so the book uh, has been published in English before. Um, uh, Manya Harari, who was a very well-known translator based in the UK uh, back in the 60s and translated, uh, you know, Pasternak and, and other major, Ehrenburg, I believe, other major Russian writers. She um, started translating Story of a Life in the early 60s. She worked on the first three volumes and then became ill and died and others took over and did the final three volumes. So all six volumes were published there um, up until the early 70s. I think the last one came out in 74 or something like that, um, published by Harville Press. So I knew there was that translation. And then even before um, uh, the British work was done, there was an American named Joseph Barnes who translated the first three volumes that was published by Pantheon uh, in early 1964. And that was what I had bought and read as a student in, in college. So I, I, I looked at their translations very closely um, only to determine whether or not a new translation was warranted. Um, and it was after like comparing the original with what they had done, uh, reading sporadically various chapters that I was convinced that that I could do a better job, not necessarily because I may be a better translator, but um, there was a lot of pressure to do these translations fast because everyone was convinced that Postovsky was going to win the Nobel Prize. And they wanted these translations out in time for any such announcement. So they worked much more quickly than I did. Um, so once I had convinced myself of that, originally I had this idea of doing, since there are the six volumes and they're huge, you can't do them all in one book, I thought, well, maybe it would make sense to do an abridged translation of all six volumes. So to take the best, the greatest hits, if you will, of the six volumes um, with a bit of commentary that I would interlace to make up for those sections that are missing so that the reader understood how we were moving from one part to another. And, you know, this has been done before. It's been done with, with Alexander Herzen's famous memoirs, which are enormous. It's been done with the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn. Um, but then the deeper I got into it, the more I realized that I hated having to pull parts out because I felt all of it was good, first of all. And second of all, um, I thought like having to insert my voice into the text to fill those gaps that I had edited out would, would make for a worse uh, translation and a less pleasant and enjoyable reading experience. So there was that factor. And then when I went to Moscow to work in the archives, I started reading some of the correspondence Paustovsky had with his various editors, uh, particularly at some of these literary journals where he published like Novi Mir and Akhtyabr, Zvizda. And it became clear to me that he was never allowed to publish volumes four and five as he had wished. He wrote a lot about Babel, who he knew very well. And um, Twardowski, the editor at Novi Mir, said, there's no way I'm going to let you put all the stuff about Babel in there. You know, he was uh, executed as an enemy of the, of the people and what have you. And, and he didn't want anything that would in any way put uh, the journal in, in some sort of compromising position with the authorities. And so Twardowski was willing to make certain concessions and never really published the book the way he wanted. So I decided that you know, if I someday do volumes four, five, and six, it would require me to go back to the archives and try to recreate the original manuscripts as Postovsky had wanted them published. It doesn't make sense to publish them the way they eventually were uh, released because they weren't really the true vision that he had. So then I ended up saying, okay, I'll do the first three books. We'll do it in entirety. And what I would do is I would, I would work directly from uh, the latest a Russian version of the texts that were published in 2017, the most authoritative that I bought over there. And I would do two or three chapters and get them to a place where I felt comfortable. And then I would go back and look at the previous English translations to see if I maybe missed something, could do something better, where they diverged from me. Um, and sometimes I, I would admit and say, okay, their version here is better than mine. And I would try to, you know, go more in that direction. Um, but I never wanted to be influenced by them while I was doing the, the original translation work myself. I will say 
I mean, it was incredibly slow process. I typically, a good day for me was two pages um, because I was constantly revising over and over and over. And um, there were certain difficulties with the text that I found. Um, you touched on it, Rachel, that he writes quite often of nature and his, you know, the flora and fauna that he brings forward, uh, you know, all sorts of plants, trees, shrubs, ground cover, flowers that I don't, I've never heard of before. And so I'd have to do a lot of research trying to figure out, well, what, what sort of flower is that? And, and then I think I would find that flower, but then I would have to double check and make sure that he even grew in the region that he's discussing. And I'd find out, oh my God, that doesn't even, you know, that grows up in the Yukon. I, it's clearly that's the wrong flower. So there was a lot of time just spent trying to make sure I'd nailed all these things uh, accurately. Um, so it was a really kind of, I'm embarrassed to say, very slow process. I know what you mean about nature. I remember there's a there's a a, a plant in one of Mandelstam's poem called Midunitsa, and and in English it's long word, and that's just so unpoetic. You couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> So poem. what did you do? Did you go with I didn't, I, did you... I didn't translate the poem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just trying to, to work it out in my head, but I thought I wouldn't attempt it at that point. But um, it's, it's touching that you were drawn into Russian literature by a translation that you then found to be flawed and went on to translate the, the work again for yourself. And I hope in better times that uh, you'll be able to get back to the archive and and do the necessary work to put to, to put together what would then be a, a satisfactory edition. Do you know that Russian scholars are putting together an edition of those that would represent um, an, an authoritative text or something like what Hostovsky would have published if he could have done so? Yeah, so I that's something that I've been wondering about. I. Uh... I met several times with the woman who's the director of the Pastovsky Museum there in Kuzminki Park. And from what I could gather from her, no one is, is actively working on that. Um, there's a lot of scholarship uh, that's been done on Pastovsky and his, his writing and his life. Um, there's even, he has his own, uh, you know, scholarly journal, Mir Pastovskova, that is dedicated to him, and that comes out regularly. There's been a lot of uh, anthologies and, and critical scholarship and conferences and all that. But I don't know of anyone that's actually trying to go back and, and reconstruct the manuscript. I think it would be really difficult because if we can't find some of the typed versions, um, his handwriting is almost indecipherable. In fact, when I visited his, his home in, in Tarusa and was in his study there, um, his uh, stepdaughter, uh, Galina Arbuzova, uh, explained to me that his writing desk had a chair on either side of it. Um, and that what he would do is he would write longhand, sitting at one side of the desk in one chair. And after he'd written several pages, then he would go sit on the other side where he had his manual typewriter and, and often start typing things up because his manuscripts were so horrendously scrawled upon, revised, slashed, um, arrows pointing every which way, words crossed out, that even he then, if he waited too long, couldn't remember what it was he had, he had been satisfied with in the writing. So, you know, I, I don't think anyone's doing it. I'd love to be the one to do it. You know, with, with Russia, there's always problems. When I was there, uh, in 2019, in the fall of 2019, doing some of this research, and I went to the the archive. It's the Russian State Archive of Rgali, Rasiski Gosudarsny Archive, Russian State Archive of Literature and Art, um, where I'm sure some of you have worked. And so I, I get there, and I, you know, I had told them I was coming. I had told them what I was going to be working on, and half of the things that I wanted to read, they informed me, well, uh, we've had a fire. I'm like, what? We've had a fire, they say. And I said, what, do you, what kind of, what do you mean by fire? Apparently um, part of the archive caught fire. Um, I think someone was heating up tea with a tea kettle where the cord was um, a bit frayed um, and had done a good deal of damage. And so they were not even able to get to the stacks um, where a great many of his documents are kept. She assured me that nothing was destroyed, 
but there was just so much fire and water damage after the firefighters came that they weren't sure when they'd be able to access these documents. So who knows uh, what's going on with that archive now? And, and again, if and when uh, the time will come that I can go back and, and, and see what's available. Well, it makes, it makes me think of uh, Robert Chandler's edition of Stalingrad that came out a couple of years ago, because that was based on a sort of worked on um, text because of the circumstances of the writing, things that been um, moved out by the editors and so on. So maybe that will happen. But t t tell us about the difference between this kind of work, your, your translation practice and the historical research that you're more well known for. Yeah, I've, I have to say, I found it um, in some ways a really nice break from uh, writing my usual works of history, which take tons of research. Um, I had just uh, published a biography of Rasputin that came out in 2016. Um, and I'd, I'd worked on that basically over five years full time. Um, it was utterly exhausting. And I'd been to like seven different countries doing research and archives all over Siberia and Russia and, and places. And um, my wife, uh, uh, bless her heart, puts up with all this. And she she's always said to people that I'm a method writer, um, that I tend to maybe uh, inhabit the lives of the people I write about a little too much and over-identify at times. And so she had lived with Rasputin in the household for several years. And I think she'd had more than enough of that. And in fact, I decided I had had enough of that. Um, and I didn't want to begin another massive research sort of project. Um, and so I started doing this and then I got distracted and I wrote, um, a, ended up doing a, a, a book on famine relief, American famine relief in Russia in the 1920s called The Russian Job about how the American Relief Administration went over to early Soviet Russia and, and basically saved the country from famine. A book I could do that was fairly contained and not too, too uh, expansive. Um, and then uh, I started back on Paustovsky and then the pandemic hit. Um, and so in a way, I was fortunate in that all the libraries were closed. I couldn't travel. I couldn't go anywhere, but I had the Russian text. Um, and so I was able to just sit at home here in Seattle and basically for two years, do nothing but translate and work on the introduction and the, and the notes and that sort of thing. So in a way, it was like nice. I used a different part of my brain. Um, and I wasn't sitting here frustrated that I wasn't able to, to, to go to Europe or to go to Russia or, or places in the States and, and work in libraries and, and archives. So in a way, it all kind of worked out well. So I think it's fair to say that though he was um, an idol to Marlene Dietrich, um, Pastovsky is not a name that comes readily to mind in the West now uh, as a great Russian writer. Why do you think that is? That's a great question. And that's something I've, I've struggled to try to understand. Um, you know, for years when I was working on this and my, my mother would always say, now, who's this? Who's this you're translating? I'd say, Konstantin Balstovsky. And she's like, why are you doing this? And I said, well, it's a beautiful book. You know, he was up for a Nobel Prize, you know, and she's, and who do you think is going to bother to read this? Um, so I had, a, I had a lot of doubters, you know, uh, along the way, um, I'm happy to say, as soon as I gave my mom a copy of the book, she was immediately uh, swept away by it and is and completely enjoying it. Um, but you know, why is he why is he forgotten? I think there's a lot of things. I think I think sort of that romantic tradition of Russian literature that he was sort of the best representative of at uh, at the time of his life. Um, has lost a lot of its fans, has lost a lot of its appeal for reasons I've, I'm not really fully sure I understand. I mean, it, you th if you think of like, why doesn't anyone read Boonin anymore? Um, and I think of, I think of Paustovsky as being sort of um, a descendant in a way of that tradition of Russian literature that Boonin represented. And in fact, Boonin uh, is interesting in that not only did Paustovsky worship uh, Ivan Boonin, but Boonin, when he was uh, in his later years in exile in, in Paris, ran across um, one of the chapters of Story of, of a Life that was published as a standalone piece in a Soviet journal called Vakrug Sveta, Around the World. 
Um, it's a chapter called The Inn on the Braginka. And Bunyan read this piece by this Postovsky who he didn't know, but he was so amazed by this chapter, which reads as a short story, like many of the chapters in the book do, that he wrote a postcard uh, to Postovsky, addressed to his publisher in Moscow, because he didn't know where he lived, and, and congratulated him on the story and said, in his opinion, it ranks as one of the greatest short stories in all of Russian literature. So, you know, he had his great admirers, but he's, he's been for, forgotten. I think that there's an element of that. I think part of it too, and maybe people would disagree with this, but I think there's an element to the fact that he's not a dissident writer. Um, he's not someone who wrote to denounce the system like a Solzhenitsyn or, or a Shalamov um, or others. And so his books can't be used for a direct ideological purpose. Um, you know, Pasternak's uh, Dr. Zhivago, uh, which as we now know quite well due to recent research, really became famous in the West due to the, the secret work of the CIA that saw in Dr. Zhivago a great political tool with which to, uh, you know, attack the Soviet Union. You can't put Paustovsky's writing to that kind of purpose. So I think that's another reason. And um, uh, just a side note to that, the review in the New York Times of the original translation of, of Story of a Life uh, when it appeared in the 60s, the reviewer in the New York Times was so amazed by Story of a Life um, that he wrote something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, but basically the fact that, that Dr. Zhivago is better known than Story of a Life is one of the great cosmic literary injustices of all time. Maybe a bit too much, but I think there's an element there. And then I think finally, um, because uh, he was very traditional in his literary style, he was no innovator, he was no modernist, he wasn't part of, you know, futurism or what have you, he doesn't necessarily win over converts within the, the academy. People who are often teaching Russian literature um, don't necessarily embrace Paustovsky and uh, prefer other writers. So I think these are a series of factors that have led to his sort of uh, being eclipsed and, and pretty much forgotten outside of Russia. So maybe now, Douglas, the moment has come because I found his writing very consoling and also tremendously evocative of, of the space that we're all now looking at daily in horrible maps with arrows coming from north, south, east and west, but the names of these cities and, and the evocation of these landscapes and, the, and these distances, you know, the time it took to get from Kiev to Odessa. Um, all of those, all of those resonances are so, so vibrant and acute right now. And uh, if we need perspective on on war and peace and history. I think Pastovsky's writing provides that with, with great humanity and, and even, yes, this, this lyricism that permeates his writing as well as his um, ability to reject stupidity. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think he writes about it in the book as something is, that's interesting and something that again, made him sort of outside sort of the mainstream and made him a figure who kind of lived at an odd angle to society is that he, he admits that even in the worst of times, he was able to see the good in things and to see the good in people. And it wasn't an act. It wasn't something he put on or something he convinced himself to, to do, but it was just sort of part of who he was as a person. Um, I saw a comment he wrote that in, in 1941 with the attack on the Soviet Union, even though he was not a young man, he was he was sent to the front lines in the South, um, in, in Ukraine, to work as a reporter. And he writes of being um, in the midst of a, of, a, of a bombardment by German forces and you know explosions are going off and dirt is flying around him and all that. And it almost sounds absurd, but he noted, he can't help it, but he looks over, you know, he's like in a dugout or something in the ground and he looks over and he sees these, these little purple flowers growing there uh, along the ground. And he finds that he, all of a sudden he doesn't hear the bombs going off. 
He doesn't hear the, the shriek of the, of the shells and he's transfixed by the beauty of this little flower. I mean, there's almost this sort of, um, you know, this Yorodivui, this like holy fool quality about him um, that makes him seem almost a bit touched, if you will, um, definitely. So there's that element, there's the beauty. And then one of the things that I find so remarkable and so enjoyable about the book, and maybe I could uh, read this little section is, is the degree to which he, he brings to life these people that he encounters because he meets all sorts of people and most of them are not famous. No one that uh, has done anything remarkable that would warrant us remembering them, but he, he finds the sort of uh, uniqueness in, in, in each human that he encountered, if you will. And he, he brings people to life and he keeps them alive, often with just a paragraph or a page or two. And I just wanted to read, if I could, this, this section. This, this is from a, a chapter called Pink Oleanders. Um, when he was still a young boy, really, um, at his grandmother's house. Um, it goes like this. My grandmother always kept oleanders in green tubs on the veranda of her home in Cherkasi. They had pink petals. I liked their grayish leaves and pale flowers very much. For some reason, I associated them with the sea, a distant warm sea bathing the shores of a land that blossomed with oleanders. Grandmother had a way with flowers. Her bedroom in the winter months was always overflowing with fuchsias. In the summer, the garden exploded with flowers taking on the appearance of a giant bouquet and burdock crowded the fences. Grandmother's garden and all the flowers in it acted on my imagination with uncommon force. My passion for travel must have been, bo been born in that garden as well. In my childhood, I used to imagine a faraway country that I was certain to visit. It was a hilly plain covered as far as the horizon with grass and flowers and hidden in among them were villages and towns. When express trains crossed the plain, thick pollen would cover the sides of the carriages. I would tell this to my brothers, to my sister and mama, but no one cared to understand me. Rather, when he first heard this, my elder brother called me a dreamer, a contemptuous nickname that stuck. Perhaps the only person who understood me was my aunt Nadia, the youngest of my grandmother's daughters. She was 23 at the time and studying singing at the Moscow Conservatory. She had a beautiful contralto voice. She would come to grandmother's in Cherkasy for Easter and the summer. The quiet, spacious house became noisy and crowded as soon as she arrived. Slender and graceful, with tousled fair hair and fresh lips parted ever so slightly, she played with us and rushed headlong up and down the polished floors, laughing as she went. Flecks of gold sparkled in her gray eyes. These eyes responded to everything with a laugh, to any joke, joyful word, even to Anton the tomcat, who looked upon our games disapprovingly with the most critical expression. It's all fun and games for Aunt Nadia, Mama liked to say with mild criticism. Her happy-go-lucky nature was proverbial in our family, and she was always losing things, her gloves, her powder, her money, but she never let anything upset her. We opened up the piano the day she arrived, and it remained open until Aunt Nadia left for her cheerful, hospitable Moscow. Piles of sheet music littered the chairs. The candles smoked. The piano rumbled. And sometimes at night, I awoke to the sound of her deep yet delicate voice singing a barcarolle. Sail my gondola, lit by the moon. Ring out, barcarolle, over the slumberous waves. And in the morning, I was awakened by an ingratiating voice, almost a whisper by my ear, and Aunt Nadia's hair tickling my cheeks as she sang, it's time to get up. It's no time to slumber, your eyes closed, having abandoned yourself to your reveries. The robins have been calling for some time, and for you, the roses have opened up. I opened my eyes, she kissed me, and then suddenly disappeared. Yet a moment later, I could hear how she and her brother, Uncle Kolya, a cadet, were twirling through the hall in a rushing waltz. He too sometimes came to visit my grandmother from St. Petersburg for Easter. Then I would hop out of bed, sensing that the day was going to be wild, cheerful, and full of surprises. Thank you so much, Douglas. And, 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 and the, this work really also reminds us something that we're all acutely aware of, 
who who know Russia and Ukraine and know this space that the interconnectedness and the fact that so many families in 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 Russia have their relatives in in Ukraine and and um, the fear and horror goes across the border and all, always they've always been they've always been um, in this kind of dynamic and intimate relationship with one another. So thank you very much, Douglas, for speaking to us about your book. And we have an audience here whom I can't see, but maybe if I switch to gallery view, I'm gonna, and everybody's disappeared. But if you members of the audience have any questions for Douglas, you could um, put your hands up or write the questions in the chat but perhaps you don't. So I don't see any questions. I'll wait a few more moments. Just little gray avatars. Oh, here's, aha, here's a question from Tufts Broadstairs Folk Week. Did Paustovsky have a further relationship with Bulgakov? or get a phone call from Stalin personally? Uh, Paustovsky, as best as I know, did not really have much of a relationship uh, with Bulgakov. Uh, they were, again, as I said, they went to school together. Bulgakov was a little older, I believe, a year or two ahead of him. Um, and as often happens at that age, I think probably looked down on the, the younger kids at school. And, and uh, so, no, he didn't really have a relationship Again, one of the things that's sort of interesting about Palstovsky is um, he was like a rolling stone. He never really settled in one place, really, until sort of the end of his life when he was in, in Tarusa. Um, uh, but in the early 1930s, um, as Stalin's grip on power became more um, noticeable and extreme and the sort of the hand of censorship became heavier, um, Polstovsky decided that he didn't want it to be anywhere near uh, the centers of power. He didn't want to be near sort of official literary society, literary Moscow. And he moved uh, to the countryside to uh, Mishora near Rizan. And he, he lived sort of a separate life away from fellow writers, a, away from sort of the cultural um, classes, if you will. And he much preferred the society of people who were doing sort of regular everyday sorts of things. And he never really cultivated relationships with the, the big uh, literary names. He once, I think, met Mayakovsky and was just so put off by the experience that he couldn't get away from it quickly enough. Um, he was never uh, directly in contact with Stalin, but as I recount in the um, in the introduction to my book, he was he was attacked uh, personally uh, for his writings beginning in the late 1920s. Um, uh, critics, um, party hacks noticed in Paustovsky a complete lack of what they called partinist of Communist Party spirit. Uh, Paustovsky never joined the Communist Party. Um, and never really used his pen to praise the Soviet authorities and write uh, um, what would be considered so full-throated um, propaganda. He did write two novels that were sort of in the socialist realist vein, Karabugaz and Kalhida, um, uh, but mostly his, his work was attacked as being too romantic, too dreamy, too far from politics, not discussing the class struggle, et cetera, et cetera. And so he very much wanted to stay away from that, uh, but he knew that there were eyes upon him. Um, and it, it's sort of a miracle in some ways that he was never rounded up, um, just as it was sort of a miracle that someone like Ahmadova also survived as long as she did. Rachel, you're on mute. No, still, sorry, we do not hear you, I'm afraid. I'm just being clumsy with the mute button. Am I, am I audible now? Yes. yes. Great. So for the third time, I will say um, that uh, the historian Helen Rappaport's 
made a lovely comment. She says, you've reminded me to read up on Faustovsky's relationship with uh, Isaac Barbiel, which I worked on for an uncompleted thesis way back in the mists of time. I'm reminded of the current Ukraine situation by memories of Barbiel's red cavalry, different wars, different times, but same sense of loss and tragedy. Thank yeah, you, I would say, yeah, thank you, Helen. Um, first of all, I, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge Helen. Um, Helen, as a lot of you know, is an amazing uh, and very prolific historian. And she has a new book that is coming out, at least in the United States, it's coming out in four days. I even know the publication date. Um, I just wrote a review of it for the Wall Street Journal. It's called After the Romanoffs. And it's all about um, basically the white immigration to Paris following the revolution. Although she also talks very evocatively about uh, Russians in Paris before the Great War. It's a fantastic book. Um, beautifully researched, beautifully written, sadly, sadly, sort of timely again with the the um, emigre, immigration crisis that we're, we're witnessing now. But definitely check out uh, all of Helen Rappaport's books, but this new one after, after the Romanovs is excellent. So Paustovsky ended up in Odessa um, at the end of the Civil War, and it was in Odessa that he lived for quite a while and became close with Isaac Babel and also with, um, with uh, Ilf, as in Ilf and Petrov, um, and, and worked with them and knew them. And he writes about Babel in some of the later edition, uh, later volumes of Story of the Life, but again, in a censored way. So we don't really know all that he wanted to say about Babel, but he was a huge fan um, of, of Babel. So, you know, one of the things that you'll find maybe reading this book is, is uh, Polskowski mentions names of writers and, and cultural figures that do make you want to go back and, and maybe uh, take a look, second look at them. Thank you, Doug. I mean, it really has made me want to go back to Babel, quite apart from going, exploring more of Polskowski as well. Um, it's such a, a beautiful, beautiful, evocative piece of work. I, I can't, so how much I, I admire your resolve in working on such an enormous translation. I do hope you get to do the other three volumes. Thank you, Helen. I hope so too. You know, sitting where we are right now, it's hard to know what tomorrow will be like, um, let alone mm -hmm. two years from now. So we, let's hope for quieter, more peaceful times when, when things like this are far behind us, but yeah, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Doug, I don't see any more questions, but can I just ask you um, what your, am I, am I audible, everyone, invisible? Yes, you're audible and visible. I can see Helen, which is very, very nice, but <laughs> it made me nervous that I was <laughs> uh, muted again. Um, yes, just to ask you, you don't have to tell us in any detail, but is your next project going in the translation direction or the historical research writing direction? Yeah, so I, I reached a point um, after, after working on this, um, and uh, about a year or so ago, I was, I was feeling a bit of Russia burnout. Um, and uh, I just decided I needed to, to step away from Russia. Now seeing what's happening, I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, as I said before, my first love was German, German language, culture, literature. And I, I lived in Vienna back in the 1980s for a year as a student, and then another year as an English language teacher. Um, and I've always been fascinated by, by Vienna, by its history. Um, and so I've decided uh, that I'm for the last year or so, I've been working on a new book, um, tentatively called uh, The City Without Jews. And it's the story of the destruction of Jewish Vienna during the Nazi period. Um, uh, obviously there's been a good deal of books on it, but what I'm trying to do that I hope will be different and worthwhile is to tell the entire story of the destruction of this roughly 200,000 people and their culture that had existed for centuries and made Vienna one of the great uh, modern cities of the world. Um, and at its core will be the story of one particular family who I discovered. Um, it's the story of a woman named Mignon Langnas who remarkably survived the entire Nazi period openly as a Jewish woman in Vienna 
from 38 until she finally was able to make it to the States um, a year or so after the war ended. Um, she got her family out to safety and then got a job working in, in a Jewish hospital that the Nazis allowed to um, operate throughout the war period. And she recorded all of this in a diary um, that is simply unbelievable, what she experienced, what she lived through and what she wrote about. So kind of like my book, Former People, where I talk about this grand epic catastrophe in, in history through the lives of two families. This will be a similar sort of epic um, story that very much it has a very personal direct um, connection that um, that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Well, that sounds like it's going to be an extraordinary piece of work, Douglas. So wish you well with that. Thank There's you. an uh, anonymous question here, which is the staff of house museums are often wonderful sources of knowledge. Were they particularly helpful to you? Well, they were particularly, um, I would say, uh, Galina Arbuzova, the stepdaughter of Paustovsky, who sort of resides over the um, house museum uh, in Tarusa uh, for Paustovsky. And the lovely woman, obviously very knowledgeable, and she can talk. I, I went there thinking that we'd have, you know, a 15, 20 minute tour, and she'd tell me a few anecdotes about Paustovsky, but I think I was there for three hours. I left feeling extremely exhausted and as if I'd almost been beaten around the head a little bit. I, um, but then I quickly sat down and tried to write down everything that she had told me during this amazing uh, tour of, of the museum. So yeah, people like that are full of wonderful information. And I tried to, to gather um, as, as, as much as I, as much as I could. And the next question I have is, um, could you repeat the name of the Jewish woman you just mentioned? Yes her, yes, her name is Mignon Langnas. So the last name is Langnas, L-A-N-G-N-A-S. And Mignon, like, like Goethe's Mignon, M-I-N-G-N-O-N. Um, and I found out about her because her son, George, is still alive and lives in New York City. And he spent a long time gathering his mother's papers and photographs and letters and he took some of them and published them in the German original with a small publisher in Innsbruck, Austria. And I happened to see a reference to this book and bought it online during the pandemic. And it was sent to me from Austria. And I started reading this woman's diaries and hearing her story. And I was so blown away. I was like, my God, this woman needs to, uh, to be known about. Um, and so long story short, I tracked down George, who's in his late 80s and um, got out of, of uh, Vienna with his sister in 1939, miraculously, thanks to their mother's hard work and gumption, um, and told him what I, who I was and what I wanted to do. And he said, Douglas, you sound like the right person to tell the story. So he entrusted me with his uh, family archive. So that's sort of how that came about. So you can Google Mignon Langnas and you'll find some things about her online. Um, remarkable, remarkable woman whose life is, is almost beyond belief, what she experienced and what she endured and how she was able to survive. Thank you. And here's another very interesting question. You mentioned that Paustovsky had lineage, lineage of Zaporozhian Cossacks. Did Paustovsky have a view on Ukrainian nationhood? He did, uh, well, I don't know about so much nationhood, but he did, um, he did make comments about Ukrainian history, about the language um, and what have you. He, uh, there's a scene in, in, in his book when Tsar Nicholas II and, and Alexandra and the family visited Kiev uh, on that fateful trip when um, Prime Minister Stalipin was assassinated by Bagrov. And, um, in Paustovsky's telling, and this is one of those things where you go, okay, is this really what happened or is this how he remembers it or wishes he remembers it happening? But he's waiting in a reception line at the gymnasium there and, and Nicholas comes and he goes down and he sort of briefly says hello to the boys and he's presented to Paustovsky and he says, and, and, you know, Paustovsky, what is that? And, and Paustovsky says, I'm Ukrainian, your majesty. 
Um, and then later in the book, he also re refers to himself as part Ukrainian. So he embraced this Ukrainian side of himself. Um, he writes lovingly of the Ukrainian language of the countryside, of, of the Ukrainian um, speech of the peasants. But he's at the same time, and this goes back to that jingoism comment I wrote about earlier. He was very much a critic of what he saw as this sort of pseudo Ukrainian nationalism, extreme nationalism of um, Petlura and his regime um, that he found to be stagecraft, phony, bogus, um, and not a natural organic outgrowth of, of true uh, Ukrainian cultural identity. And at one point he, um, he was criticized by uh, a couple of Ukrainian intellectuals as being um, anti-Ukrainian and he denied that. He said, I am part Ukrainian. I grew up in Ukraine. I love Ukraine, but I'm opposed to nationalism in all its stripes, whether it comes from a Russian or Ukrainian, I'm against uh, nationalism. And I'll just add, that was another sort of struggle I had with the translation is that um, obviously Polstovsky wrote in Russian, Russian was his native language. He knew a bit of Ukrainian, he knew a bit of Polish. Um, but Russian was his, was his native language. Um, and so when he writes about all these places like Kiev and Yekaterinoslav and Kharkov, and um, he obviously gives them the Russian names. And when I started the translation, I struggled with what to do about the names themselves. Uh, you know, should, uh, should I spell Kiev the way it's been traditionally spelled uh, or the more current contemporary K-Y-I-V um, and other cities that now have completely different names. And I went back and forth with this uh, for a while I updated all the names to their current usage, whether in Ukrainian usage or Polish usage, Belarusian usage. And then I changed my mind and I thought this doesn't make sense because it doesn't reflect the world that he lived and the world that he experienced. Um, and so what I did is I ended up going back and using the, the words that were used in, at his time, the way he used them. And to show you how absurd it became when I was trying to do this, I just wanna read this. At the end of the book, I have a note on the translation where I describe my process and why I did this. Um, and I wrote, I'll just, it doesn't take long, but <clears throat> the names of the streets, villages, towns, cities, and even countries mentioned in the story of a life have in many instances changed from the time when Polstowski lived and wrote. The multinational empire Paustovsky was born and grew up in collapsed in 1917. It was then reconfigured in the early 1920s, only to collapse again in the 1990s. The successive waves of political and social upheaval brought with them linguistic changes as well. This poses challenges for the translator. What, for example, is what is one to do with a street that has had four different names? Paustovsky writes about Kiev's Bibikovsky Boulevard, as it was called from 1869 to 1919. But before that, it was known as Boulevardnaya Street from 1834 to 1850, and then Shoseini Boulevard from 1850 to 1869, and was given, uh, only given its present name, Taras Shevchenko Boulevard in 1919. Kiev is now Kiev, Garadisha is now Kharadisha, Yekaterina Slav is now Dnipro, and the list goes on and on and on. So kind of a long answer to, to you know, names and Ukrainianism. And I say in there that by using the Russian spellings and names, I'm not insisting on some sort of Russian nationalism, but more, again, trying to capture as best I can the world that Paustovsky lived in and the world that he described. Thanks, Doug. I think I, I think you I think you did the right thing there. So I've I've got uh, one more question and then a detailed question from from the audience. Um, it seems surprising that Paustovsky was able to achieve such renown and recognition in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. without being a party member, including through the Stalin years. Was this unusual? What accounts for it? And another um, member of the audience has just asked whether you could repeat the name of your work on the American Relief Fund. Okay, so yeah, it is, it is remarkable that he never joined the Communist Party. He never added his name to a denunciation of another writer. Um, uh, 
he lived, uh, he found some way to live a life of basic decency amidst, you know, the horrors of, of Soviet totalitarianism. How can one explain that? Um, I think part of it was, was fate and luck, which is how, what he attributed to. I got lucky. Um, there was a few of us, again, like Ahmadova, who somehow were not ground up in the, in the, you know, the, the meat grinder of, of, of Stalinism. He, I, think, I think staying away from the big cities helped. He um, avoided Moscow, Leningrad, things like that. It just appear being off the radar was a factor. He wrote much about nature. He wrote about historical figures. So he wrote things that were in no way could be viewed as dissident literature. He never attacked the regime directly. Um, again, for which some people have, have criticized him. Uh, so I think there's an element of that. Um, but I think a lot of it was, was, was really kind of a sort of you know, twist, twist of fate. Um, in my in my estimation, Prishvin would be another good example. The writer Mikhail Prishvin. Sometimes he and and um, uh, Postovsky are compared. Both people who wrote for children. Uh, Postovsky wrote a good deal of children's literature, as did Prishvin. They wrote a lot about nature, um, and so in a way, by writing about nature, maybe you avoid the the potential for you know drawing the wrong kind of attention from from the authorities. But Prishvin too is a man who managed to have a very full career and a, and a very long life. So I think those are probably the main factors. I mean, I noticed that when I worked on my book, Former People, about the destruction of the Russian aristocracy, um, with the degree to which there was so much of a randomness to the horror, a randomness to the terror. And there are people that survived and died of, of natural causes as old people that you thought for sure would be singled out for persecution, but for some reason or another, they weren't. And so I think that's also what makes the terror somewhat even more terrifying. There wasn't necessarily always a clear logic to how it was exercised. Um, as to the recent book that I did, uh, it's called The Russian Job, um, which is what these American men who worked for the American Relief Administration called it uh, when they went over. It was, it was orchestrated by Herbert Hoover, who was then Secretary of Commerce before he later became President of the United States. Um, amazing story. Uh, it was a remarkable book to work on and research. Um, uh, it just came out with an excellent publisher, Corpus Books, in, in Moscow um, a few months ago. Um, and there's a group of Russian filmmakers that are, in fact, doing a documentary right now that I took part in about the famine in the early 20s and about the American relief operation. I will be amazed if they are allowed to show this movie uh, given the current political climate once it's done. Thank you. So one more question. In what way was Pastovsky's anti-war sentiment acknowledged by the Soviet authorities? How explicit was it? I would say it wasn't acknowledged by the Russian authorities. Um, uh, I would say it was, it was not handled. It was not really discussed. The criticism that he chiefly got was his utter disregard for class struggle, his utter disregard for any sort of um, uh, writing about the great, uh, if you will, laws of history that were, you know, marching humanity into a bright communist future. He had no time for that. He had no belief in that. He didn't want to write about um, uh, shock workers. He didn't want to write... Um, um, about the great, you know, strides of the Soviet Union and what have you. He was chiefly criticized for that sort of thing. He was harshly criticized um, for his, uh, his sort of humanitarian view of things. There's a lack of revolutionary wrath and um, his sort of uh, damp emotional uh, love of things small and weak and and sentimental and romantic that was often deemed not what official writers should be engaged with. Those were typically uh, the kinds of attacks that 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 he faced. I think there are more questions. Two more. Ah. 
have there been adaptations of Pastovsky's work for the stage or the screen? And yes, there have been. Another, yeah. another okay. audience member is just thanking, thanking you. Oh, okay. Oh, and asking, you. sorry, I've just seen it. Um, asking when the book will be on the shelves in the United States. Got it. So um, a lot of what he wrote was um, uh, uh, used as the basis for films. A lot of the, he wrote a lot of children's literature and, a, and I think maybe a dozen of his children's stories were turned into um, cartoons for kids. So you can actually watch Paustovsky cartoons for kids. If you, I'm sure you can dig those up on, on YouTube. Um, he wrote um, the uh, screenplay for a movie about the life of Lermontov that has um, a score that was done by Prokofiev. So he worked together with Prokofiev on that. Um, and then some of his other works were turned into, um, into films as well. One of his most famous novellas was called The Telegram. And that was one of the works that, that Dietrich had read in translation that she loved. Um, and there's a Soviet version of, of Telegram. And then there's a, a, another one that I've seen on YouTube. Uh, it's called Dajdlivy uh, Rasvet, sort of the rainy dawn or rainy morning, if you will. Um, it's kind of nice. It's a short piece, maybe, maybe 30, 40 minutes, but it stars one of my favorite Soviet actors, Oleg Yefremov, uh, is in the lead. And you can dig that up on YouTube uh, as well. So, and there was even ballets that were that were made based on some of on some of his works. So he sort of his writings entered out into various uh, sort of different sectors of sort of Soviet cultural life. Um, as for the U.S. edition, that will be published by New York Review Books uh, probably um, in January uh, or February, twenty twenty three. And I don't know why it took them a whole year to get it, their act together to do it behind the, the UK publication, but um, such is life. And maybe, I don't know, maybe that's better. I, I worry that right now, maybe people don't wanna buy books by Russian authors. I hope not, but maybe in a year, the things will be better for folks uh, trying to talk about the good, the good things about Russian culture and history and life. Well, there are members of the audience thanking, thanking you for, for this talk. And um, let's hope that in its UK edition, it does good this year. And in its US edition, it does even more good next year, whatever the circumstances, because we know, don't we, that literature lasts and has truths that can sustain us and take us forward in the dark times. Thank you so, so much. Doug. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you, uh, Denise, for organizing. And thank all of you for coming. I realize it's a Friday night there. Um, there's probably a lot more exciting things you can do than talk about old Russian books. But thank you for coming. It's been a real pleasure to, 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 to chat. And um, do check out the book. I, I can't recommend it enough. And um, everyone be safe and well. And let's hope for, let's hope for better days. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good Bye. Night. Good night. Bye. Good night.